and also the connections that you can establish with open Athens to create or in most cases extend an existing single sign-on experience through to your library resources and applications. Now to quote the commercial director, the digital revolution in the world of information management has created an abundance of data. As end users move across digital applications, each interaction can be tracked and measured at different points of the journey. So we provide a window into this as our statistics can be used by information professionals to provide insight into the work that you do. Ultimately, by using statistics, we want to be able to draw conclusions as to be able to make informed decisions. So journals, research and business intelligence are all significant investments for any successful organisation. Uh, the evolution of a portfolio of resources depends on a mixture of cost, total usage and effective feedback to the library. So with the statistics and feedback, knowledge managers will have the information needed to ensure that a fresh, vibrant and accessible collection is available while also ensuring that they are valued by the organisation and meet the needs and requirements for those conducting research. Towards the end of 2018, we released an updated version of the statistics and reporting module. Uh, previously, all that was available was a resource usage summary report, summary report sorry, in the form of a table. Um, and there was a, an exportable option as well, should you have a data analytics tool to interpret the data. Uh, so since the release of the new reporting tool, we've made it possible for you to report on engagement by groups defined by yourselves or even down to the individual user level for specific resources. There is, of course, still the top level comparison of which resources are being accessed by all within the organisation. Uh, so with that being said, I'll just jump onto the Open Athens administration area now to demonstrate what's available and how to use the tools. And as Sophie said, we will be um, sharing these slides as well that were um, sort of prepared. But again, based on your feedback, we'd like to demo the actual process. So this here is the clinical knowledge networks. Um, well, it will be their statistics area, and they've kindly allowed us to demo their, um, you know, their reporting features. So. Um, within the administration area, I think I should probably mention that step. Um, within the administration area, to get to the statistics section um, at the top, simply click statistics and then reporting, or in the top right corner here, there is also a, a graph, which again, takes you through to the reporting page. Um, so this is the reporting dashboard. Um, this interface introduces snapshots of data so that you can see, for th see things, for example, like the top resources used in a particular time frame the total authentications made again in a particular time frame and the total accounts and um, if you were to click any of these little widgets you would be taken through to that section of the administration area and we also have an interactive heat map here should you want to see you know the usage broken down country to country the darker uh, patches here is where the um, service is mostly being used and the clinical knowledge network are based in australia so it's no surprise that that's where it's mostly used um, so on the top, on the left hand side here is the data explorer um, and this is where you would define the report you want. It's split between accounts and resource usage. So within the accounts section, um, the account reports here is made up of activity relating to the accounts such as password changes, accounts expiring, accounts being modified, deleted, created, um, just anything, any activity to the account really. Um, so yeah, this information can all be found by selecting totals and then you define the parameters to break down your data. Um, so we've got different dimensions here. If you'd like, you can just simply check by this organization or if you wanted to see the, you know, the total accounts or the changes made to any accounts for the entire organization, you would click all organizations. And this can be broken down by um, you know, account status, type, activity, or job role. It really depends on what information you've got being passed through to Open Athens. Um, and then of course you can change the granularity to be daily, monthly, or weekly. And again, you can select the dates here. So you can be really flexible with that. Um, so next is the authentication totals report. And this displays the total amount of time, um, sorry, this displays the amount of accounts that fail authentications and why. Successful authentications are also included for comparison. However, there is no breakdown on this as the resource access report, 
So the other reports here, resource usage is where you would see the um, usage beyond the authentication. Uh, so the dotted line on the graph here represents the unique users authentication or authenticating through to OpenAth. And so you can see here on the Saturday, well, the 1st of Feb, there were 342 individual users that accessed Open Athens successfully. And of those 342, there were 433 successful authentications. So you can see here that, you know, maybe one in every four of the, of the users accessed Open Athens twice. And all of these are clickable as well. So you can see, you know, the other data sets that are available. So um, what do those other data sets mean, Blake, just so um, we're, we're clear? Uh, so say, for example, one of your users went to authenticate through to Open Athens and typed in an incorrect password. This would be the data that represents how many users on a specific date entered the wrong information. Um, and then, of course, so a, uh, you know, a failed authentication due to an expired account. So that, that shows you that data. And say, for example, the account shouldn't be expired. You go into the account section and you mark the account as active again. Uh, locked accounts are those accounts that have tried to attempt to access Open Athens from more than three countries in a day. Now, while this is possible, um, most of the time it's unlikely. Uh, so this is just some sort of security measure, really. Um, if a user ever does get locked out of the account, all they would have to do is contact the administrator and the administrator can then provide access to them again, enable the account again. Um, and then lastly, within the account section, is the account usage reports. Now, this data represents the amount of times users or groups of users successfully authenticated onto a publisher's platform. So here in the authentications part is the successful authentications into Open Athens. The usage is the access to the resource, the publisher's site beyond the successful authentication. And you can break this down by country, uh, network, job role, group, permission set. Again, it depends what information you're releasing to us and what your reporting requirements are. So we have a question okay. from um, Anne, who I think this was based on the um, accounts authentications report. Sure. He says, what period does the change refer to? Is that a previous month or other selected period? Previous month or other selected period. So what period does the change refer to? Oh, so she's asking for the, the section. Um, I think the change would be based on um, let's have a look. So, um, I'm not entirely sure. I may have to come back to you on that one. But if mm -hmm. it, in fact, I do know. So this this um, the data for today won't be available until tomorrow. So at the minute, it is showing. If I was to go back to the 26th and just only display data that is available. The change would be from the ma um, the maximum, um, no, from the beginning to the end. Sorry, so you can see that there's 711 at the beginning and at the end, yeah, 767. So the change, you know, throughout the entirety was plus 56. Um, so yeah, it's just really displaying the the difference from beginning to the end of that time frame. Yeah, so you can track, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so the more exciting part of the um, statistics area is the resource usage reports. So if, if I just quickly summarize, you know, within, within the accounts totals is all of the total... Sorry, I've got some other you questions. Yeah, so, um, yeah, sorry guys. So um, Kurt has pointed out, yeah, the change seems to be based on the granularity chosen at the top. And that is correct, um, Kurt, because um, that change will, that will change because the um, increase or decrease um, would, if, will obviously be different based on a different definition of time. Um, so Kurt, yeah, Thanks, uh, Kurt. You, are, you are correct, <laughs> yes. Um, and um, Terrier, am I, I'm really sorry if I'm not saying your name correctly. Terrier or Terrier, um, can you see who the specific users are behind the data? For example, the 924 failed expired, who are they specifically? Um, so yeah, you can drill down to that. 
Um, again, depending on whether you're releasing individual unique identifiers for that for that user. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely possible to see who it, which account expired and when. Um, so how do they? How would you do that? Uh, you, you would be able to see that within the account section, so out of the statistics area um, okay. in the account section, um, it, will, it will display all of the expired accounts, should you wish to see those. Okay. Okay, yeah, and so again, just to summarize, summarize the accounts total section is the um, changes made to account records. Authentications is the authentic successful or failed authentications into Open Athens. The usage account section is to do with the successful authentications onto a published site beyond the authentication through to Open Athens, and then resource usage is again beyond that, so drilling down even further. Um, so these statistics are based on a user being transferred to a resource as part of a successful authentication. They, they don't show you what the user did on a publisher's site, it's simply a log of when a record or a user was transferred successfully. Um, you can break these reports down by um, by group, job role, permission set, and resource, um, and, and whatever attribute you have added uh, using your schema editor, which I'll talk about a little bit more later in the webinar. Uh, so we have, a, we have a question here, and um, what does, what are the, what do you mean by permission sets? So can you explain what that means? So a permission set is, so say for example, you've got a group of users and you only want to be able to provide a select few resources to that, to that group of users. A permission set is a collection of resources made available to certain groups. So it's grouped access, which you can control and define yourself. It's very easy to do. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it again uh, a bit later. Um, so these resource usage statistics here for the resource access, they can be broken down in more ways than any other, and this is because you can have a secondary breakdown. Um, now, it's fortunate that um, the Clinical Knowledge Network, who we're demonstrating Yari for, have very good, a very good data store. So if I wanted to see, you know, all of the resource, if I wanted to compare registrars and midwives, you know, it, I, I wanted to see their total resource usage for one particular resource. I can select which resource I want to see. You know, let's just do MIMS online. I go here, break down by group or job role. I select the granularity. Okay, let, let's say we want to do it for the course of a year. We'll go to monthly. We'll go to this date set here. We'll go to the beginning of the year last year. And yeah, there we go. So that's the total resource usage for registrars against nurses. And all of these are you know, clickable. You can have as many or as few as you want. Um, and it's just a way for you to be able to see who within your organization is using the resources the most effectively. Um, so the last thing I wanted to show you before jumping onto the connection subject is how to save and schedule any report. Uh, viewable within the reporting area. So say, for example, you wanted to save the report that we're viewing right now, all you would have to do is go here, click Save Report, um, and you can either choose to save this to my computer, create a saved report, or view it as HTML. Now let's say, for example, I want to save it to my computer. You can have this report, you can schedule this report, save this report, sorry, for just this specific in organization, or you can have a summary for all of the organizations within within your domain. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, continue, we have a couple of questions. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, and this can be downloaded as a uh, CSV file or Excel. The Excel file is comma delimited, which uh, makes it easy for you to be able to import that data somewhere else. Right, I'm actually gonna put my video on as well, so it doesn't look like Blake is uh, <laughs> talking to himself. Um, so we have um, a couple of questions. So um, the first one is, when I bring up my YouTube reports, I see resources that are not part of my collection, how, how can I delete them and why is this happening? So that has happened because you've made those resources available within your administration area. Um, so that, that, that's what you've allocated them effectively. Um, you might, it, says, it sounds like you don't have a subscription to those resources or they shouldn't be there. So yeah, yeah I would recommend going into your resource catalog 
and unallocating those resources that shouldn't be there. Um, if you'd like me to explain how to do so, I can do so offline. Yeah, I'm making note of that. Um, so um, Blake will follow up with you um, afterwards to make sure that um, that's all clear. Cool. Uh, also, there's a couple more questions. Okay. So Blake, before we move on. So um, uh, is it possible to see a list of resources with dates, times that specific user has accessed? Again, it all depends on what information you feed through to us. If there is a unique identifiable um, attribute, then yes, we certainly can. Um, so if I was to go here, break down by, um, there would be, if again, you release that information to us, uh, a record here and you click that and then it, it would be quite lengthy, but there would be all of the unique users here and you would find it, select it, or alternatively, again, you can export it to Excel and it would be easier to find. Yeah, um, Ian, what I'm going to do is, um, uh, Blake can uh, show you again, can follow up with you yeah. um, on the um, specific user access. Because, um, yeah, it's, it's, in the, uh, it's in the same, um, the, the methodology behind it is, is exactly the same as what Blake's been describing, but um, I appreciate it might be very clear for yeah, not doing it in real time. I think I'm, um, I, I'll be mentioning it. A, a little in a little while but yeah. yeah you can you have the capability to be able to report on any attribute that you send to us um and i'm just about to go on to talk about the schema editor as well which is where you can say for example you release an attribute to us you can edit the attribute so that it means something else so that it can be interpreted differently within open Athens, and then that can be released to the publisher should you allow it yeah um, someone uh, who's asked this question. So we've got, um, we have usage from different countries like Italy and Kenya. Are these, our users right now traveling in these countries and logging on into our databases from there? So I'm assuming that's, your, obviously you don't have any campuses there. I'm assuming that's why they're asking yeah, why they it. have logins from there. So we can't, we can't tell you exactly where they are, but I think the, the, how we determine the location is based on the uh, browser settings. So they, within their browser, that you know they'll pass it through an IP, and then there's just a way for us to be able to determine where, which country that IP is registered within, and then of course that is populated into the country's field. So yeah, um, you might they they might be on holiday there and conducting research. Yeah, great. Um, so Yasmin said, I think this is um, based on the question about uh, resources being um, uh, allocated, uh, uh, resources and usage reports that are not part of their collection. Yeah. But a couple of comments on this. So someone said um, it could possibly be um, allocated by the discovery service provider. Um, does that allocated by the in relation to report um, report the report claiming uh, containing resources that are part of their collection, um, I, I I I do it, I'm not entirely sure whether that is right or wrong, um, but I, I'm confident that it's got something to do with the fact that it's well not the fact sorry that it's allocated within their administration area. It might be not it might not be displaying any resource access usage, so it could be zero. But if you've got it allocated, then it will display in the statistics area. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Yasna said, yes, um, I've had this happen and she's, she's agreeing, yeah. Cool. Um, and then Anne said, um, we, um, in regards to the same topic, I believe, we've had lots of authentication attempts show for resources we've never provided. Um, I think that was in, I'm not sure if that was something that we said or one of the comments. Yeah. There. Um, so what that could be is, say for example, that particular user has found the resource that you're um, questioning on Google. They go to Google and they find the login via Open Athens. Um, the organization discovery option will be there for them. They'll search for their institution or organization. They'll try to access it and then on the publisher's website, it will say, you do not subscribe to this, please contact your administrator or your library, but Open Athens will log that attempted authentication um, so this could be used to you know determine whether it's something even worth subscribing to i mean if you start seeing it very regularly then there must be a demand for it within the organization but yeah it's not a successful authentication it, it could just well be you know it's just showing you the attempt okay um, and um, so Ben has just said, vaguely related to the current discussion when running in restrictive mode is it possible to customize the forbidden message i won't attempt to answer the <laughs> permissive and restrictive mode question. I'll defer you to somebody technical. Um, 
Okay, so we'll Ben, I uh, will that's absolutely fine. And um, Ben, we'll forward you on to um, one of the uh, dev team who'll be able to have that question. So that's fine. Um, so, um, um, Bonnie has said about um, us showing how to, yeah, um, uh, I actually, sorry, interrupted Blake as it was showing how to schedule reports automatically. So, if we do that quickly at the end, um, I just wanted to quickly ask a question which um, I hear quite a lot um, through conversations. Um, with our some of our, libra our librarians is how you can use reports in order to um, as a tool for um, working out um, like future licenses and looking at your license collections and how this can be and um, how this is a really powerful tool for um, helping make decisions based on licenses. So do you want to just give that a bit of a description? With the scheduling reports? Um, no, so with um, how this can help make decisions on licenses. Yeah, for sure. At, yeah. Well, I mean, um, say for example, you know, uh, so again, you, you can if you have the unique identifier attribute being released, you can identify exactly how many unique individuals are accessing a resource. Now, if you're looking at that over the period of a year and you're paying for a license for, you know, a thousand users and you think it's being used a lot, and it might be, but um, that you can drill down and determine that, you know, it's only being used by 10 people. That will allow you to then go and, you know, negotiate a better license with the publisher, one that's more suitable to your needs. And then using the permission sets, you can make sure that only the people that need to use the resource can access the resource as a way to not breach your content licensing agreement. Yeah, so it's a potential money saver and um, yeah, yeah, so definitely. that's um, one, one way, yeah. And um, so Kurt has another question. Uh, will this recording webinar be available, made available offline? Yes, yeah, so um, this is all being recorded um, and it'll be available <coughs> on our um, YouTube account. Um, but I'll make sure you all receive um, a um, copy of that recording in the follow-up email that I send um, to everyone. So, Kurt, yes, you will get um, this um, the recording of this. Um, but um, just in case um, you'll still have any questions, obviously um, getting in touch with Blake or myself um, to have that is obviously <laughs> always always an option as well. But yes, you will you can you can rewatch rewatch us um, talking about recording. Um, just bringing us back on to the uh, scheduling of reports. Yeah, automatic reports. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. So here, right, let's say, for example, you want to save this report and you want to do, you know, MIMS report, registrars versus the midwives. You can, you know, select to save this by monthly, weekly, daily, um, monthly would be most likely. And you can choose whether you want this to automatically be sent to yourself. Um, and the your email address, if you are the administrator, will be populated. So. You know, you click schedule and once a month on a specific day, I think it's the fifth of each month, you will receive that report. If you wanted to, you could select for this report to be sent to other individuals and you can have as many email addresses as you want in here. You just enter, you know, your colleague's email address. If the report is, you know, relevant to them, not yourself, and you don't want to see it, you don't want to plug in up your email, your, your inbox, you enter your colleague's email address here and once a month they will get the report that they need. Um, those links, they only work for 30 days, so I would recommend saving it or downloading the data um, and it might also be worth noting that the reports are a read-only format so they will only see the data set and the parameters that you sent that you have selected scheduled and then sent them they won't be able to play around and see any of the other data available to you as an administrator yeah can you just um show again how you get to um that section again there's a little bit of a lag on the screen as well oh, so can you just yeah, show sorry. how you do that again one yeah, more time? so again you would select all of the info you need you know have the people that you want so registers and nurses and it's here this schedule report button a little it, clock yeah it's a little clock little clock icon um, you click schedule and then again, yeah, you select how often you want it and who you want it to be sent to. Once it's been saved, it will appear here under saved reports in the scheduled folder. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the um, saved reports, yeah, is accessed just on the left hand side where the accounts and resources uh, reports are accessed as well. That's it, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, Bonnie, it's the clock. Um, and uh, just to, to make a point about these reports, another great thing, um, another great feature or a, a reason to use them is once um, you've scheduled the reports, once you've set the parameters that you wanted, for example, like we said, registrars versus nurses or student X versus student X group versus student Y group for the BMJ, for example, once that report is scheduled, you won't have to re-input, you won't have to reformat that report again. So once you've done it once, 
I'm correct to say, aren't I? Yes. yes. You don't have to. Um, you don't have to do it again. So um, you can carry on turning out um, all of the information in the report that you want on a regular basis, but you won't have to keep coming back into um, your administration area in order to find that information. You only have to do it once, um, and you can you can schedule as many. You know, you can schedule lots of reports at the same time. Um, so yeah, you know, this this even though it might seem a little complicated to get it up and running. Um, uh, once you've done it, you don't have to do it again um, for that particular report, which I think is a really, um, a really important part to say uh, for the usability. Mm -hmm. um, that's is that that's wrapping up the yeah the decision yeah. reporting. Um, so we just want to quickly make a few points on this. Um, so we are only really kind of scratching the surface, and that was a very very brief in introduction on reporting. Um, you know, we've, we've, we appreciate this is a very, um, can be a very complex topic. Um, and um, we, we're bit, basically, we're very happy to revisit reporting as many times um, as you guys see fit or as you guys need. Um, and, but, so we just wanted this to kind of be um, a start introduction in, into the reporting environment and how to kind of generate reports from, from a basic level. Um, so if you guys have any more questions before we move on to um, the next topics, even though they do um, they do fit in with reporting, um, please let me know. Um, let me know now. Um, if not, if there are any areas of reporting that are still not clear, um, even if even if we've already covered them today, um, please let me know because we're we're more than happy to go over this as many times as as necessary. Um, God, it's taken me such a long time to even begin to understand. Um, how it works. So if you guys need any more help, um, please just let us know and we'll make sure we, we go over it again. Um, but yeah, just a few words from me on, on, on reporting because I know it's, it can be tricky. So, okay. Yeah, so if we carry on and I'll note sure. down any other, any other so points. So now, now that I've explained you know, roughly what types of reports are available to you within the administration area, I thought it might be useful for you to know how the data gets there in the first place. So SAML, which is the language that Open Athens and you know, the identity providers, the service providers interoperate with, it stands for Security Assertion Markup Language. And it allows identity providers to pass authorization credentials to the service providers. It simplifies federated access management. Um, and to put it simply, really, it just means that you can use one set of credentials to log into the many different websites and applications that you subscribe to. Um, so Open Athens has the capability to connect to many different identity providers so that you can use existing login credentials to access your library resources. So let's say, for example, your institution or organization makes use of Office 365 and you have you know, one of their directory systems in place, so like Azure or ADFS, although there's many others available. If you were to establish a connection between Open Athens and your directory, then only one login would need to be made at the beginning of each research journey for them to be able to navigate from resource to resource without being prompted to log in again. So the main benefits for establishing a local directory connection really is to automate the account provisioning process and the deletion process. So you can, you know, select after 30 days or 365 days of inactivity, automatically delete this account. And then it's automatically deleted a further 30 days later, you know, to comply with GDPR. Um, and of course you can bring those dates back as to, to be as you know, short a time period as you want. Um, and another main benefit for establishing a local directory connection is that you can feed additional data into Open Athens for your reporting purposes. You know, you can get really granular depending on the data that you input. Um, so to view the connections, you go to the management tab here and then click connections. Um, and then on the left hand side here, you can see that there is an add button. Um, so within here, so uh, yeah, so let's assume you don't have one. There wouldn't be anything here. You'd click add. And these are the handy wizards that are available for you to use to be able to establish the connection. Um, the most popular options are, are displayed here, but let's say, for example, you wanted to establish an Azure connection, you would go to SAML 2.0, follow the documentation guides available to you by us or on the Microsoft's website, um, because we are listed in their store, um, and you would exchange metadata, define the rules, um, the permit, you know, the, the claims, sorry, the information being released to us, you would map it, um, and then, yeah, you're, you're good to go, really. I mean, it, 
sounds easier than that, but th this would be where you would get IT's involvement and it's likely to be the only time you would need to involve IT unless of course the IT department are managing the solution because not all the organizations have libraries or information professionals. Um, and yeah, so you know, you'd go to your IT guys, you'd say I want to schedule a call, it would take between 30 to 60 minutes. Um, and we'd make it as stress-free as possible, you know, with the use of guides and support from the solutions team. Yeah, um, and if, if there were, was any, if you guys needed uh, kind of live help as well, yeah, there's, uh, yeah, of course, our technical solutions team and our service desk um, are there for that as well. The only information needed um, to provide, uh, or to establish a connection, you, you need a unique identifier attribute, attribute, and in most cases, uh, that could be the email address. Um, so. Uh, we encrypt this information, of course, so that this doesn't have to be disclosed to your identity or no, to your publisher, sorry. Um, although, if you'd like to provide personalization features to your users, such as saved searches and folders and things like that, then yeah, the unique identifier would need to be passed to them unencrypted. Um, so while we only require a name and email address to provide the seamless experience to your users, it's, it's entirely possible to send us as many attributes as you wish um, so as you can see within here, um, this is a, you know, a, a dummy connection that's been established. We've got first name, management account, last name, email address. Now, say for example, you wanted to send through course code or department or you know, store, anything you like. This could be used to create the groups needed to be able to report against those groups. Um, I mean, it, again, it's entirely possible for you to establish these connections yourselves. However, you know, support can be provided and it really does provide a better experience for both users um, in, the, in the fact that you know, there's a single sign-in experience. You log in once and you can navigate through to all of your resources without being prompted to log in again. And then of course, it makes the lives easier for the administrators because they're not having to create an account for a new user halfway through the year or remove a user halfway through the year. It's all automated. Um, okay, got a question. Nice. Um, so the question is, how do I obtain an XML metadata file for the connection? Um, so you would get the metadata file from your directory. You would input it here. So let's say, for example, you need to establish an ADFS connection. You go to configure, you pop your metadata file in there, and then you get the metadata file back. So if it's automated, you would put yours in, um, you know, it's, it looks like a URL, um, and then you press add. Um, if you wanted the XML file, which I guess is different to the link that would be um, generated um, as a result of then putting your metadata, the, the XML file is available on the internet. Um, we could, we could, I could send you the link to that. Yeah, so it, yeah, so I'll, I'll write down a name. Is it, um, am I pronouncing it Talishi? Uh, Talicia. I'm everyone has such nice names in this pub and I'm murdering the pronunciation of all of them. T, thank you. Um, so, um, sorry, that's so embarrassing, but it's a beautiful name, but I'm just not doing good on saying it. Um, uh, so, great, yeah, great to hear that you uh, want to do this for your ILS vendor. Um, and uh, great, so said, uh, she says, do, so do I put the link, put in the link from the vendor? Is that with the... I know, so, um... You, this, so you're referring to an LMS, so that, that's yes. separate, um, that's slightly different. So say for example, you, would, if you wanted to allocate a resource, that would be done here as a, um, a custom resource. Uh, you would go to add and it would be a custom SAML resource and then that's where you exchange metadata. So what we're referring to here in the connection section is a, an active directory connection. Some, uh, it's a connection between you know, your central database of staff information or student information to feed through to us with the LMS, um, yeah, yeah, that would be a um, a custom resource. Although I do believe, in some cases, depending on which LMS, you can. So it really depends. You can use the LMS to log into Open Athens, or you can use Open Athens to log into the LMS. It really depends on what order of which you're going to be doing things yeah. in. Um, so T, what order is? Um, because um, yeah, there are sort of questions. Um, and uh, you, you're really keen to, to set this up. And um, Blake will follow up with you personally to help you with that. Um, and um, yeah, we'll get you sorted. But I'm really pleased that you were, uh, you're excited to get that done. And yeah, you're welcome. And yes, um, to reiterate the uh, recording, will, this will be recorded. I had a couple of other people ask about um, the recording. I think, um, yeah, in case you guys need to, to drop off, you're very welcome to. Um, someone has just raised their hand. So I'm hoping this means 
Um, T, do you want to come off your? Um, do you want to come off mute, or are you happy? Um, oh, you just raised. You put it down again, so I think that might mean that your question was answered. Um, but if you'd like to come off mute, then please um, raise it again. Um, but yeah, Blake will um, be in touch to help you and um, uh, to to take you through the whole process. You can get that set up. Definitely. Um, so the last thing I wanted to show you is the schema editor. Uh, I mentioned it a couple of times a little bit earlier on. Um, so you find that by clicking preferences and then clicking schema editor. So these core attributes um, are, you know, these are default. Um, of course, you might not be passing all of this information through to us, but this is what um, you can link your information to. Um, to define any of these. And so you can mark these as reportable or releasable. So these are releasable attributes that you can be sending to the publishers. Um, and the reportable attributes uh, is what you would use to be able to then start gathering reports. So it, you, the reports only start collating once you mark it as releasable. So if it's information you want, yeah, definitely mark it really as releasable from, from the get-go. Otherwise, when you go to get the information, it's not going to be available because you didn't mark that uh, attribute as releasable. Um, so yeah, th so this is useful for if you want to send us custom attributes which have the potential to be released. Um, so, you know, some publishers, they require additional information. Um, you know, some, some, some are fussier than others. They require additional information. You know, it's, man it's mandatory for you to provide an email address. It's mandatory for you to provide, you know, X, Y, or Z. So this is where you would release that information from. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover today. I, I appreciate that it was a, a brief overview of each subject, but if you do have any specific questions related to any of it, then we can you know, answer those offline. Um, I'd like to thank you all for attending and listening. Um, and again, yeah, any questions, please do come to myself directly or, or to the you know, contact app mailbox, the generic. Um, but yeah, um, and I'd just lastly like to remind you that these webinars are for your benefit. So if there are any subjects or topics, topics that you'd like discussed in a future webinar, please do let us know and yeah. we will, of course, speak about them. Yeah, we will. And uh, we actually um, have another question for you, so they're still coming in, so please keep them coming. Um, what is the length of the authentication period? How often would a user need to log in again? Um, sorry, Yasmin, um, I'm a little bit late asking your question, so I'm not sure if... Um, it's eight, uh, eight hours. Eight, eight yeah. hours, okay. So each, each session would last for eight hours. Um, so say, for example, again, you connected your directory and that is your authentication point, that's your login point. Once that cookie has been created, the open Atom session will run for eight hours. Great, awesome. Fab. So, um, would you mind going back to the slide? So, even though Blake has kind of summarised everything, um, we're just going to quickly um, wrap up um, to, to um, remind you. Well, we uh, we did have a, um, some slides that would be following um, this presentation, and all these slides will also be made available to you. Um, and they've kind of very briefly, just kind of skip through them briefly, um, uh, gone uh, kind of mentioned all of the, the points that we've been talking about. Um, and so we'll make sure this is available to you um, as a kind of reminder of, of what we've been talking about. But obviously the recording is probably going to be the most useful um, part um, from this webinar. So I think if we just keep, yeah, keep going. So um, we, I wanted to put this slide in quickly before we go. We've got about 13 minutes left, but um, we'll only take another couple of minutes. Um, just to um, mention, well, I'm on two screens now, um, <laughs> um, just to mention, um, that um, in February, uh, so obviously um, this month, um, you know, we've gone over a couple of things, including Steam Editor um, connections and reporting. Um, just to mention that next month, unfortunately, we won't be doing this webinar because we have our um, Open Athens conference, um, and so um, um, our conference, and so we're unfortunately taking that month off. Um, but we will be definitely back in April um, to uh, continue this webinar and series again. Um, and then in April, um, we kind of have a loose um, agenda of going over redirector and discovery links. And we can touch on reporting again um, and a few other topics and, and you know, into May. Um, but as um, Blake said, this, um, if you guys have any topics that you uh, would really like us to cover um, going forward, please let us know. Because um, as he said, this is, this is for you. you know, we, we can make an assumption of what we think people might want to hear, but it's really down to you guys. Um, uh, as well on, on what you want to see. Um, and Ian, thank you for your suggestion. So 
Ian says, would it be possible to have a webinar that covers allocation of resources to permission sets, permissive, um, permissive restrictive. restrictive, and how to set this up without reliance on the SP? Okay. Yes, definitely. So this is the kind of thing that's really great um, because um, that's amazing. Uh, so Ian, we have your, we'll make sure we cover that next month or in April. Um, and Laura, the recording's going to be on YouTube. Um, so, and I'll make sure I send that out in our follow-up email as well. So you're gonna go to the next slide. Sure. Thank you. Um, so we had this last time um, about um, kind of what our um, uh, product teams and our um, dev teams are doing. Um, if you guys are interested in reading this, this these slides will be made available. Um, I won't read through them um, because we've all had a bit of an information overload in this hour. Um, but this is here for you um, from uh, Luke and um, he's um, part of our um, development team um, in case you guys are interested. So go to the next slide. Um, as always, we also have the virtual learning environment as well. So our VLE is designed um, for you guys um, to, uh, was well, a guide basically, um, another, another way of you guys getting some support um, using um, your open app and software. Um, so along with these webinars and um, speaking to us, um, you know, our service desk and our, and our account manager, Blake, um, this is another option for you guys um, to make sure that you're um, clear with, um, with the software. And it's worth having a look at that as well because it's a really useful resource. Um, so I think we'll wrap up. We've kind of gone through questions and bits and bobs, so you can just slide yeah, to the, yeah. keep going. <laughs> okay, um, so um, our next webinar is in April and I'll be sending out the information for that um, as well soon. Um, and obviously keep an eye on the 101 blogs um, because that will, those obviously these webinars follow, these webinars follow um, those blogs, bit of a tongue twister there. Um, and um, as ever, uh, as ever we've, you know, we've mentioned over the past couple of months, our Access Hub conference um, in March um, still has room for registration. We're still um, accepting registrations there. So if you guys are interested, we'd absolutely love to see you in person. Blake and myself will both be there. Um, and we'd, uh, we'd love to see as many of you as possible. Um, and it's going to be a really great, a great day, hopefully, um, for all information uh, managers and identity providers um, alike. So yeah, great. Um, thank you so, so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much for engagement. And um, we hope you found this useful. Um, and thank you for a few, you know, some kind words in the chat box. We really, really appreciate it. Um, this is only our second one, so we were still a little bit nervous, and um, yeah, and uh, and um, you know, worrying about how it was going to go. But we're really pleased that um, you found it useful, and see you all hopefully sooner. But if not, see you in April, um, and we'll uh, we'll crack on to the next topics. Thanks again. So great. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Everyone. Bye, -bye.